people. How's it going? Well, it was my second attempt at reading out a card memory. This seems to happen to me all the time, so it takes the wind out of you. So who knows, maybe it's, it'll be more coherent. I was losing it on the other video, I must be honest with you. All right, how ancient megalithic stones were moved, part two. All right, that's part two. Okay, 5,000-year-old mortise and tenon joints discovered in England. So uh, it's uh, 3,000 BC. That's right around the time that they've uh, dated Stonehenge, somewhere in that neck of the woods. Most of Stonehenge stones have one flat side that suggests they were pulled across the ice and snow to the final destination on that smooth side. So they were honed smoothed out before they were part of the sled you know they were they were you know maybe there was a jig or you know some kind of a, a structure around it but they were able to uh tow the uh stones easier elephants were also used to move heavy stones like in baalbek and the heliopolis elephants vibrate the ground as we know that lady over there in africa figured it out and um what are we talking about? We're talking about harmonics, somatics, okay? You vibrate something, just give it a little push, boof, it goes across the room, all right? Now, if it's sitting on ice or snow, it's going across the field. In this case, we're going to get into it. Um, around and making it easier to move stone loads, okay? The moon, unbeknownst to humanity, or well, people that haven't read my moon book, which I suggest you get on, get it, and check it out. You can read it for free if you're a Prime member on uh, Amazon. Uh, it's in uh, Kindle and uh, paperback. No, I, I wrote that book with uh, another great researcher over there in England, Wendy Salter. And uh, we did a good job, I'll tell you. A lot of compliments. The moon on being out to humanity comes closer to Earth during the Ice Age and lowers the gravitational field, also making it easier to move megalithic stones where all these stones were moved, okay? It's, it's all based on the ice-water ratio. The ice gets bigger, the moon comes closer. The water gets bigger, the moon goes further away. I don't know why they haven't figured this out yet. I'm putting this stuff out as best I can. You know, I'm putting it in simplified language, really simple, so they can, you know, they can grab at these, uh, you know, uh, high-end physicists that can use like terms like perturbation and, and uh, undulation and, all this other, you know, you know, 25 syllable words and basically take the idea and make it their own. I really don't care, but let's move on, people. Come on, dudes, you know? All right, here's the uh, glacial uh, layup from uh, glacial striations that have been sampled across the uh, continents. And, uh, you know, they get down to North America, you get to, you know, Europe, England, Ireland, you know, over here. And then, you know, obviously it's coming up from the south. Um, point being, this little area in here, which is real hot now, is actually a, just like New England or, you know, uh, it's a four season. They have winters, they have snow, and they can pull stones around if they want to. All right, here's the uh, best gift ever made. But when you're in low tide here, the gravitational fields are, are, are increasing at that area, making it denser right in here, right in this zone right here. You get a high tide here, um, you know, the, the weight is, is less. You know, it's, it, the moon is pulling the water up. It's pulling the water up. It's going to be making you lighter, relatively lighter. I mean, we're just such small two, 300-pound people or 100-pound people. You know, really, it, it's an, an, an insignificant um, weight change. But, nevertheless, it is a change. Okay, now if you catch, if you catch the moon, there's, a, there's a, a perfect time to catch the moon right before it comes up. It's the, your stone, just say you're moving your stone block. It's going to be heavy, but right when it comes over, it's going to pull, pull that stone towards you or, or towards the moon, or you could push it a lot easier. So you're doing these large thousand ton moves at the Heliopolis and Baalbek or Stonehenge or whatever. You know, the ancients knew this stuff. Um, they knew a lot of stuff. There's been a couple of institutions on the planet running around, throwing this stuff, burning books. 
hundreds of years ago, getting rid of all this information. So we're, we're relearning it because uh, it was the devil's work. All right. Okay, now we're moving on uh, with the devil's work here. <laughs> the average load on some of these sleighs out here in Minnesota, Pacific Northwest, I mean, they, they were like, they were moving things 25, 30 tons. They said in my other video, uh, 100 tons. I mean, each one of those log minimum weighs, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 pounds. I mean, obviously, you know, that that's close to, a, um, you know, a, a 100 tons right there. Or 50 tons, whatever, you, you know, conservative estimate, 50 tons. Elephants, there's uh, Tilla the Hun, you know, with his armies there. And uh, poor elephants, man, they've, they've gotten a, they're getting a bad rap. It's like the horses, man. You know, they're just dragged into this crazy, crazy human um, existence. And uh, why, it's just, just violence, you know. Here's a 5,000-year-old uh, mortise tendon joint, southern England, I think. And uh, obviously they were they were uh, they were more than more than capable of constructing sleds sleighs to transport large massive stones uh, or anything for that matter. You have the uh, Eskimo um, Kamatic sleigh here. The technique they use these things are great. You're, you know you're hauling seals, fish, whale blubber, what have you, and. Um, you know, people, they've, they've utilized our reindeer and, and uh, dogs to uh, pull the pull the loads. Uh, it's just another, you know, uh, simple technique of construction for sleds. Um, here's, here's what we're uh, told is what we were doing, but unbeknownst to everybody on the planet, there's actually ice and snow in these areas at, at these particular times when these, the pyramids and the uh, megalith Baalbek and all these other all these other huge temples with these megalithic stones. So we didn't you get rid of the roly roly poly logs and throw some ice and snow onto there. A little bit of a, a little bit of a curvature to the front. You know, strap it to people, horses, oxes, cantaloupe, whatever, <laughs> elephants, and it's gonna pull that much easier. You know, and uh, obviously you use the moon. You know, the moon was, the, the gravitational field on Earth with the moon was much more profound. Like when the moon came around, you know, and, and was over you, you, you could probably jump another two feet in the air than you could just say at low tide. Low tide, you probably jump three feet. High tide, you're jumping five feet, okay? That's, that's how intense it was, unbeknownst to the scientific community. That's what's going on on the planet. Um, here goes an older sleigh. These are stones out here in uh, the Giza Plateau. Myself, I was in India, uh, yeah, Egypt twice, but uh, didn't quite uh, make it to the temples or the pyramids. But anyways, it's working for the government. You keep, sometimes you just can't do what you want to do. It's the, uh, you know, cut, cut the stones. Now, if you wanted to, you could like, you know, cut, cut the stones this way, that way. All right, just one lower at a time. Block it up, you know, Block it up on this side, fill it in with water, wait for it to go below zero or below freezing. The ice swells up, pops the blocks off, you know, bring it over to the pyramid via the snow and uh, put, the, put the pyramids together, okay? Easy peasy, Japanesey. Um, again, here's another closer look at it. So basically you, you would cut your stones, cut them all, fill them up against the, the bedrock. You know, you wouldn't just slice all the way over. Put the water in there, wait for the water to freeze. They pop off. You know, you just dust them off a little bit, file them up, get them ready for the uh, put in place. Here's like, a lot of these stones have these straight, well this, the, t the tenon has a lot of two straight edges on it, but a lot of these other snow, uh, stones, most of them have a straight edge on one side and they're, they have uh, beat, the, beat the crap on the other side. So that tells me that they were, you know, they were, before they moved them, transported them, they used the smooth side, obviously, to push them across the tundra to uh, get Stonehenge back together again for the 15th or 200th time. How many times they've erected this thing, who knows. But um, right here is a, uh, I think it's Stone 46 or 7 or 42, yeah, I forget. But um, 
it's got it's got a uh, a honed center right out of it okay so it's rounded it's like this you know i don't know if you can see my hands but it's kind of like that all right and that's the same way they're making uh, a lot of skis you know they'll have it they'll have it hollow in the middle today they'll have it hollow in the middle and, the snow, and they'll run on that they'll run on the outside so both sides so you can have the stone flipped up on those um, on the uh, the curves and just cruising down the road so point being there could be another one out there like that buried who knows they did find some stones buried at Stonehenge that actually had uh, mortise tendon joints in them they actually had square holes in them so that tells me that these stones might have been actually part of the ski of a large sled to move the big um, the bigger stones, the sarsen stones, so the sand stones, these, this is a blue stone. Talk about stones, stones. All right, people, get your stones together. Um, yeah, again, you know, you get the straight edges, then a real wobbly edge, a straight edge there. I mean, they're all, you know, you gotta be there, and, you know, walk around, it's, it's a, quite obvious. And uh, your uh, professionals out there, your real professional, um, archaeologists, Stonehenge people, they've, this has all been written down, documented, in videos, seminars, whatever you want to call it. So it's, it's fairly common knowledge. And um, there it is right there, people. The moon, responsible for moving the larger stones back in the uh, Ice Age. Again, you have smooth edges here, smooth edge here, wobbly, wobbly, smooth. Uh, this is smooth, and this is this is uh, wobbly, or crooked, or not as not as uh, cut to perfection as the other ones are. There's a larger view here, and uh, you know that's that's it. I mean, it's a fabulous place. It's definitely an energy energy site there. And I was with uh, uh, my colleague there, and, and we were uh, you know taking a trip around, took some pictures going up to it. Now the moon didn't quite come up over the horizon here. And uh, so the, the dense, so the, the energy is being pulled into the stones. It, it, the uh, clouds were actually coming down vertically right over Stonehenge. It was just the most amazing thing. So it was, it was the day of the, uh, there was, it was the, uh, the winter solstice. We had the, uh, a full moon and on the winter solstice. An awesome place to go and check out these energies and they were uh, really, I mean, this, this really doesn't give the justice of the photos I got of what was really happening over the top of them. And as soon as the moon came up, this stuff just, just, just disappeared. It just, it just blew away. Um, point being the energy is right before the moon comes up, the energy is coming through them. And then once the moon comes up it reverses and then, so these are getting heavier. Stones are heavier before the moon gets up and they get lighter once the moon's up over the horizon. And uh, like I said in my earlier videos, I've been doing experiments on this stuff for years. Seismic energy transmitted most officially between the 10 and 40 hertz in the same range as the fundamental frequency and second harmonic of an elephant a rumble. It turns out that when an elephant rumbles, a, a replica of the airborne sound is also transmitted through the ground. Elephant sounds have been measured as traveling at about 309 meters per second through the air and about 248 meters per second through the ground. Pretty fascinating. Um, here's everybody at Baalbek, on it. Again, the moon's closer to the earth. You got elephants, you got snow and ice. Uh, you know, I rest my case, you know what I mean? Nobody else has got a theory on it like this. This is the best theory you're going to get. You can go all over the, you know, you can do the alien dance all day long, but, you know, we, we are the aliens, okay? All right, here's another at, at the uh, Heliopolis. You got a um, thousand ton, thousand ton. These things are two million, two million pounds, however which way you want to use the units of measure to uh, describe it. Here's one that wasn't completely honed out. But again, they cut these things out. A little bit of snow and ice. Get your elephants in there. They're vibrating. It's all good. Here's a poor elephant right here. Uh, tugging, a, tugging some stone up a uh, creek. Um, you know, vibrating, whatever. I mean, these, these animals really taking a beating to, um, 
you know, do a lot of construction in the East, uh, you know, th thousands and thousands of them die, um, on, on, uh, not so much uh, today, hopefully, but while well, they're being chased down for their tusks. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's horrific, you know, I, you know, it's like, um, uh, it's another topic. I don't want to go off, <laughs> go off. It's like, get the net out. Anyways, you see the moon here, driving it home, it's straight edges, you know, they, they could have been rolling these things down the, uh, down the side with a little bit of uh, mortise tendon joints. Um, harnessing animals, you know, they had, they could have harnessed reindeer, um, uh, caribou, obviously horses, elephants, who knows? Maybe back then they had the, um, we had the flash freeze over there when you had the uh, woolly mammoths. So you take any animal from birth and you can domesticate it. This stuff, all animals became domesticated 10,000 years ago. Slap, slap. Let me get, get, come here. You know what I mean? Get these people in a headlock and straighten them out. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. It's, it's like, it's just that fundamental. Look at us. We're trainable. You know, they get us from birth. Look at, look at us, you know. Perfect example. I rest my case. Okay, here's, here's the typical um, scenery in the Ice Age. Cruise up the tundra. Hey, what's all that stuff? It's ice, you know. So this is the ice, you know. This, this is, and this ice is like 10 times harder than uh, regular ice, like your ice cubes in your fridge. A lot of it's got to, you know, be, before it thaws out, there's like, you know, a mile or so of ice on top of it. So it's crushed and compacted and blue, and it's it's very hot. You try to chew an ice cube, try to chew some of this stuff, you'd be breaking your teeth. Break your teeth on regular ice, too. You can ask my dentist. Um, all right, I guess I made my point. Basically, moon comes closer. You get a low gravitational field. Things are lighter. When you're in sync with the moon... And the other planets, watch my other videos, and uh, kind of make a point there. And um, that's it. You know, I'm going to do another video on uh, this particular technology that I'm, I'm bringing, bringing forward into the human consciousness. All right. Here's some books. Got another book coming out. Um, you know, obviously, it's, it's like it's just one of those things you just got to sit down and do it. And then if you want to, uh, you know, help support the uh, channel. People complain about the quality of the work. Hey, give me some money. I'll hire some people. We'll get some great work. We'll have uh, Walton do documentaries. It'll be uh, amazing stuff. So, uh, anyways, thanks for all the likes. Thanks for everybody out there commenting, uh, positive comments, even the negative comments. You know, keep them going, even though I don't want to deal with it. But hey, it, it forces you to look at your stuff, and we get to a higher level of uh, consciousness, understanding. So the next generation doesn't have to slug it out like we are. Okay, people. Peace out. Keep it real.